Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Anitsu, and you're listening to the DigiTalks podcast, the show that covers various topics from news to meta developments and everything in between for the fine folks who love the Digimon trading card game. Just as a quick reminder, I do stream this live over on twitch.tv slash Zenitsu, and it's also uploaded as a YouTube video on the YouTube channel of Zenitsu, as well as being on various different podcasting platforms like Spotify. Today, I'm with my co-host, Teddy, and we're going to be talking about the logic behind the lack of an official online simulator, along with some information in regards to uh, the new reprint booster, uh, resurgence booster, technically, RB01 for short, and the information that we have based on some early leaks and, uh, you know, what Bandai has posted. Uh, before we get into that, this is the part where we normally would talk about tournaments, but unfortunately there are no tournaments to talk about, so... Uh, next week. Yeah, that's that's going to be hopefully next week, because next week there's an Ultimate Cup. This is kind of the lull period of long formats where sometimes we have an event every week, and then sometimes we have them every other week or once a month. Like, it's it's just a wacky time, um, so like we don't have an original. Yes, um, which is the thing that we care more about, granted, now that with the whole change, I guess regionals don't have as much weight, but isn't this wave the one that's going to have the, the mega lineups? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. So I think a lot of people are going to be looking at just that prizing of all of the protagonist megas and the fact that they are all reprinted SRs that are all borderline playable. I think that pricing is definitely going to be really appealing for a lot of people made me sign up for one and i already have my two round buy i'm excited can't wait to play it's gonna be in person too it's gonna be a good time yep uh and i believe oh god do you know if rb1 is going to be legal for that or not i think it would be yeah yeah it is it's legal okay so uh how much of it will be used probably not much but i mean but hey it's still legal so it, it RB1 still kind of, and I'm saying this very loosely, kind of changes the format. There's only four new decks that are introduced, and only two of them are realistically competitive. Uh, but we'll get that into that, uh, like, as far as the RB1 information. Or we could just do it right now. Uh, but before we actually get into the RB1 stuff, uh, since we're already on that topic, just as some clarification from last week's episode when we were talking about tribals and archetypes, uh... To further elaborate on that, the difference between tribal and archetype, which I think we need to distinguish a little bit more, is the fact that tribal is designating the card's trait. So decks like Bloom Lordmon are a tribal deck. It is tribal plants, fairies, and vegetations. Archetype is by name. So when cards are referencing other cards by name, like Greymon, that is a archetype. Uh, at least that's the official definition of what an archetype is. And then tribal comes from magic, where if you're playing like an elf deck, everything in the deck is an elf. So that's kind of the distinguishing factor between the two. Not that yeah, it makes that like, much uh, of a difference, because right now Digimon kind of treats them the same. But I think like it does in the long term, because tribals allow for more possibilities than archetypes. Yeah, I think... Um... It was a little gray. Maybe we didn't... I feel, I feel like we definitely talked, said it. But maybe it was just gla glanced upon and maybe we didn't elaborate further um, last week because I know there was some comments Yep. about that stuff. Uh, so going back a little bit more on topic, uh, the Gamamon deck, that is a archetype. Everything cares about the Gamamon name. Same thing with Jellymon, same thing with Angoramon. Those are prime examples of archetypes. Uh, and these are archetypes that are going to be coming out in RB01. Uh, Manzimon is also going to be another archetype uh, that's going to be getting support later down the line. As the fourth deck introduced, I did a whole review on the my, my YouTube channel on RB01. I 
came off kind of negative in that review, but that's because I actually learned of the pull rates. And even now, I see on, like, various different forums that I'm a part of, nobody's really talking about the pull rates. And the information is actually out there, and it's kind of staggering how bad the pull rates actually are for this set, and how expensive cards are going to be from this that are new as a result. So if anyone's unfamiliar with your usual pack pull rates, a normal booster pack from any booster, basically the breakdown is as follows. You'll get like one uh, rare or secret rare or above it at the very back of the pack. Then you will get a, another rare, a dedicated rare slot. Then uh, you will get three uncommons. And then the rest are going to be commons. So because of this pack breakdown, it makes getting rares and below relatively easy. That's not going to be the case in this set. This set has six dedicated slots towards common and uncommon reprints. Then it has three designated spots for the commons and uncommons that are brand new. And then it's going to have one rare slot. This is just a generic rare slot that can be used for either the new cards or the old cards. Doesn't matter. It's just the rare slot. Then you have one promo slot. And then the last slot of the pack is going to be an SR and above. So because of these pull rates being the way that they are, it doesn't really seem like it's going to be very easy to pull any of the new stuff, which is the things that most people are going to be caring about if you're playing competitively, because a lot of these reprints don't really seem to matter because of how old the cards are. Yeah, this layout, I don't think was it. Like, they could have done it better. Yeah, in, in my review, uh, I did mention that because of these layouts, the... Uh, secret rares and the rares are going to be the two hardest cards to be able to get what you want. Uh, but based on some more information that's kind of been coming out ever so slowly, it seems like there's going to be a little bit of trouble with SRs as well because they might have or be giving higher prevalence to the reprints versus the new stuff. Yeah, I think there's more. I mean, one, there's also just more of the old stuff than the new stuff. So, yeah, there's there's tw what twenty one super rares in I believe so. 20, yeah, so twenty one or twenty one or twenty two, one of those. Numbers. Yeah, and we know that there's in a booster box twenty four packs, which mathematically the average means that you should see at least one of each. But because you know that's just the or, mathematical average, that's not the reality. Uh, you're going to be getting duplicates, and there's a higher chance you're going to get a duplicate of not one of the new cards, which means now you're not seeing the new cards, which means now the new cards are going to be even harder to get. Uh, and please, for for the love of Pete, uh, do not buy into pre-orders most of the time. The only one I was considering was the Secret Good Rare Lord, because that please. card is stupid, hard to get, based on this information that we have. Don't do it. Whoever, I don't know, I don't know where... It, unless you just don't have another option and you really want to play an RBO one deck in these tournaments, which I don't see why you would, but maybe you really do. But don't buy the pre-sales. I mean, everyone's going to tell you that. For some reason, people still do. Just don't. Like, still, I'm the still cards looking... are going to be worth nothing in like a week or two. They're going to be worth nothing. Well, at least not what they're current. Cards. Yeah, at least not what they're currently worth, because right now a lot of the cards are pre-selling for way higher than they reasonably should. So, like, you have a lot of the rares are, like, literally just generically sitting at, like, 4 or $5. Like, they're, they're not going to be worth 4 or $5. Most of the, even, like, the normal base version of the card before the reprint isn't 4 or $5. So, there's no reason why, just because of the foil treatment means it's going to be four or five dollars granted it is in the rare slot but again uh not all the Doesn't rares matter. are not all the rares are powered equally uh so 
Yeah, that's just people taking advantage of the presale market, trying to capitalize on FOMO. There's not a whole lot of listers uh, because only certain stores are able to sell presale. And all of them are scummy. All of them. I'm not going to sit here and say none of them aren't correct. They'll adjust. The, they'll try to make the money that they can early on and then adjust as the set's life uh, and the card's life goes on and they'll just accordingly but like a lot of these super rares they're we haven't had a super rare that's above ten dollars in a long time the fact that all of these are already valuing above ten dollars that's already very sketch and very fishy like i said the only secret rare that i would even remotely consider is proxy is proxy proxy is the, the other only one card i would even irrelevant. consider i'm like most of the other secret rares are Utterly irrelevant. So it's like, or they're not even used in any other decks, and very, very rarely here and there. So it's like, just, I promise, whoever's telling you to guys to buy them, no, just don't. It, it'll be okay. The cards will come. They're gonna go down in price dramatically in pr a week, literally. And I, I promise you, they are gonna be worth. It next to nothing in just a week's time yeah proxy just already kind of be. has been slightly going he's been listed for a little bit less but uh yeah so don't buy into the pre-sale hype uh even though the newer cards are probably going to be the ones that people are going to be picking up more than the promos or not promos more than the reprints yeah the um, reprints so they're, I'm, I'm expecting those cards to be a little bit higher from a value standpoint, but from a meta standpoint, none of these decks are actually that good. Like the only two that are remotely competitive and I'm using competitive loosely because very, they're still missing very. cards is going to be Jellymon and Gamamon. And because proxy is going to be so expensive, you're actually going to be seeing less Gamamon because now players are going to be forced to do the double serious build which doesn't have the highs of proxy. Yeah, so it's basically like you either shell out the money for proxy, which a lot of people are not going to. There's going to be, of course, the few that do, but a lot of people aren't, which will then, the price will go down eventually. Just like a bunch of other cards, like, what was his name? Um, Exomon. That card was expensive for, for no reason for a long time, and then it disappeared, and now it's worth nothing. So it's like, just give it some time, promise the cards will go down, and then maybe they'll spike up when the promos start going, but I don't think they'll spike up big enough to where it warrants being like, oh, we have to buy them out now. So yeah. Like, it'll be okay. Like, you, uh, anyone who hasn't watched my review probably should, just because I do give a lot of information that nobody was talking about. And I'll cover some of that here, because, like, just from a mathematical standpoint... Um, let's just take the rare slot, at, or the, yeah, we'll do the rare slot and why it's going to be a little bit on the more expensive side. So there's what, 32 different rares in the set. So a booster box contains 24 packs. You're guaranteed one rare in each pack. Well, just by that math, you're not going to be seeing mathematical average one of every rare. So that's going to affect the price of some of the rares because now you're not going to be seeing them all, which means they're not being opened as much, uh, let alone sold as much. Uh, the commons and uncommons, I think, are going to be okay. Um, I don't know if the commons and uncommons are weighted the same within them. We need more information in order to further like gauge that, but... I think commons and uncommons are going to be okay. The SRs, I think, can be scuffed. Um, but the mathematical averages, we're going to at least see one of every, so it's not going to be that bad. The promos, you are going to be, again, mathematical average. You should see at least one of each promo per booster box with some overflow, just because there's 17 promos versus 24 packs. So there's, like, what, seven additional yeah, promo seven slots? Extra slots. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah so i don't it's really just going to be the rares and the super rares and then i don't know how weighted the commons are versus the uncommons uh but those shouldn't be that bad but no, when i learned I about this it's just the SRs. yeah when, when i learned about this information 
Uh, I already knew, and I was expecting it going into RB1, the pull rates to be really, really bad. Um, but this doesn't make me any more excited knowing that it is, you know, my, my worst case scenario, it is that bad. It's, it's pretty, uh, unfortunate, but I don't think it's the worst. I just think it's just not the best. I think they definitely, the whole point in them stalling the set was to, you know, get the reprints in there and but they they did it to a detriment now and it's like i don't mind i want the reprints there but i think they had to average them out differently yeah Uh, we also didn't give bandai the opportunity to explain themselves so like we as a community did, did kind of shoot ourselves in the foot with our response i'm glad that bandai listened don't get me wrong anytime uh, we could outrage mob and have a company change because of it. I'm all for that. Just because we don't get those wins very often. It's just that win ended up actually being a loss because we didn't know the scope of the plan. And they didn't bother talking about it until it was pretty much too late and we were already pitchforks at their door, figuratively, not literally. Um, but... It it is what it is. This is the this is what we asked for, and it just sucks that the reality is basically exactly what Japan got, and Japan wasn't happy, which is why they tried to change it for America or English. Uh, can't well, America specifically because English covers more. Yeah, yeah, more than just the Americas, actually. But. Yeah, because uh, funny enough, all of the <laughs> early information uh, that I had gathered. Uh, was Spanish. Spanish people like I don't know if it's Spain or Mexico, um, but they were. It, it's not a knock on anything. They just so happened to speak Spanish. That that was the only commonality between the two early posters that I was able to get this information from. They get the product dramatically earlier usually, and they well, I should say they get it and then they break street dates. Is usually what ends up happening. Well, they didn't, the as time. far as I know, they didn't advertise, like, some other mm-hmm. games I've played in the past. Like, hey, this store broke street date very obviously and very clearly. No, these were just individuals oh, no. who not might gonna... have had an arrangement with their store, because I technically am guilty of this, too. I've talked to my store in the past to get product a little bit early for YouTube, so they could have done the exact same thing that I have done. Um, and it's not like it was dramatically early, like insane, like almost a month. Cause sometimes they've done that in the past, not again, yeah. specifically for Digimon, but for other games that I've experienced. Yeah. But I think yeah. like they would get their product early, which makes sense based on, uh, just how their shipping logistics yeah, their work. Location. Yeah. So they would need to get them out because maybe it's harder to, to get them to have it on time. So just because of their location. So I don't know about that uh, on that front. I'm not Bandai, so I can't speak to why that is all the time. Uh, That was just a funny correlation that I had noticed. But regardless. Irrelevant. Irrelevant because you don't need any of the cards in this set. Um, And we, as of right now, have no idea when we're getting the LM cards, uh, which are the cards that are actually going to make these more competitively viable. But again, because of how the game has been progressing, it doesn't really seem like it's going to matter because we're getting cards too late from when they are needed and when they're relevant. And Bandai has a really bad habit and reputation of doing this, especially with their promos like, oh, Where's that promo Galactimon that we could have used like two sets ago yeah, when the Destramon. card was relevant? Oh, dude, that Destramon would be is like actually really good too. Like they did it correctly early on, a total of once, maybe twice. But outside of that, because we got uh, BT4, we got those promos, the power up promos, on yeah. time. Like we got Forgot them when that. they were supposed to come out, and that did change a little bit the context of the set and the decks that were playable which i thought was really really cool um it just sucks that whatever happens there isn't happening now and we're getting cards way too late for them to matter i was like i don't think that's happened ever now i don't think we've ever gotten the promos on time after that time 
No, we, we have not. I think the only other time was uh, the the other power-up promos for BT9, which was like Sagittarius mode, Bout, uh, Boutmon. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's correct. That is correct. Those, we those, those were the only ones that were more timely. Yeah, we did get those on time. But it, it still was a little later than it should have been. But um, we did get those around the time that they were supposed to be there. So not the worst, I guess. So two. Two out of 13 sets? 14? Yeah. 13 sets. Two out of 13 sets. Main sets, I should say. Yeah. Their, their track record usually isn't pretty good but the fact that they had to delay uh rising winds or resurgence booster just made the issue even worse because we changed their whole like lineup and that had other ramifications that we're not even aware of which does kind of suck as a result because I would have liked these decks to come out a little bit before BT-13, so that way they have a higher chance to be more relevant and impactful, and it also uh, keeps us in line, not that I'm saying this is a problem, but it keeps us in line more with how Japan got theirs, because now we're getting them after, and now none of these cards actually matter, and it just it just doesn't feel good from a player's perspective. Yeah, it's a little it's a little lame, but I I don't mind because I do know that the like these like Gammon specifically, that deck does have some staying power where it is still being used in Japan relevantly, but that's also because they've got promos and things like that. So for us at the current moment, this deck will have no it'll be okay. You might steal a win here and there. Um from meta decks at least. You'll probably will if you're good enough. And uh, maybe you get a bit lucky, but <clears throat> and then Jellymon is the same. We, there's some promos that we need that make the deck dramatically better. But you might be able to steal a win here and there with the support that's available now. But the, I, the sad thing is, I actually think out of the two, for our current meta, Jellymon, Jellymon has the highest potential to be better. Just because the price of Peroxy is going to be astronomically high. To the point where people aren't going to want to play the deck. It's just like, if you're not already heavily invested... Yeah, if you're not heavily invested in Gamamon and you don't have all of his cards, not only are you going to need the off promos, uh, which Gamamon's is the most expensive out of all of the off promos that aren't inside of the set, (laughs) um, but you're forced, like, on a budget, you're forced to play double serious, and the the promo serious isn't nearly as good as uh, garbage atroxis or uh peroxy combo i mean you could just play arcturus mon you don't need to play proxima mon i think arcturus is better with proxima though thing is you could use him just to trash security because it's just anytime something is destroyed so it's not that bad to use it with serious mon since serious mon nukes stuff um yeah but i also it's not the best but i think it's not bad. I think I think I, think I would rather use that than use the promo because I don't think the promo does very much. The promo's okay. It's a good budget card just because again the pull rate on the promo is going to be more generous than it is on the uh, super. Of course. Of course. And if the supers uh, are weighted even harder to pull, then that just makes people lean into using the cheaper option more often than not because, well, they would have had it if they opened up booster boxes versus the other two, which there is a high chance that they could not even see any of. So it just it puts Gamamon in a really weird spot because of that. I think Jellymon and uh, Angora aren't as bad because they don't have a secondary level six, so you're kind of just forced to use the promo. But again, that's not yeah. that big of a deal it's because... Not- yeah because at least the promos for them are still okay they're still on brand uh, yeah they're relevant for the decks for the most part Gammon's is just not that great over using Arcturus and, and Proxima at least right and then uh, the other two are also just cheaper in general just because mm-hmm. uh, there's not as much hype around them 
So it's going to be interesting to see how these decks actually perform. I know we're kind of sleeping on Monzemon, but Monzemon is incomplete. So almost there. It's just a, it just needs a, like a solid more. It's right there. Just I mean, one more. He doesn't actually have a win condition currently. I I will say that right now he is a control deck. He doesn't actually have a win condition, which is what's keeping him back right now. Like nothing in the deck is giving security attack plus. Nothing in the deck is like actually uh, pushing Suka, things forward. It is just a slower mean? control deck. King Suka hits hard as long as you have a lot of them on the board. We don't have King Suka tech. yet. King Suka? Yeah, you do. No, we don't. Yeah, you do. He's the one that gets security tech for every Sukamon name. He's a, he's here. You're you're not using that in Monzemon. Yeah, but that's not better than you doing uh the what's it called um the because you're not playing Sukumons. monkey deck. Yeah, the you're you're not deck. playing Sukamons though. That's the problem. I feel like the monkey deck is just better. Well, I mean, because Mon it is, because it is more complete. Like, that's what I'm saying, where Monzemon just isn't complete, so there's no real competitive viability to it, because the way Monzemon oh. wants to work, it doesn't have an actual win condition. I mean, even Nexa, it doesn't... It, the, the monkey stuff gets more stuff. The poop stuff is better. Well, because you, there's... But you can use Shu, you can use Monzemon in the poop deck. It's just... No, you, you really can't because there's too many good Sukumon and Edamon cards that you'd rather use. So like Monzimon <laughs> wants to use Numimon stuff and uh Edamon wants to use Sukumon stuff. So they're they're diverging into two completely different decks. They're not even remotely the same on what they're even attempting to do. So like they, yes, they, they Sukumon, the deck together. that is more supported, is going to be stronger because it actually has more of a win condition. Uh, what's it called? Because we're getting the rest of the Monzimon stuff in BT14 and BT15. So Monzimon as an archetype really only has a very small select handful of cards that it actually can use. I have demo, like I have example <laughs> decks in my review if anyone's actually interested yeah. in seeing what these decks look like from a conceptual level. I didn't know there was Monzemon stuff in next set. Uh... Yeah. So, like, all of these decks have, oh. like, staying power. Yeah. It's just right now, they're just not that great because the good stuff isn't exactly here. Like, these are just more of the shells to be able to have something playable. And the LM cards that Japan has, that's going to be, like, what really brings home the deck into what it's supposed to be. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. So I try not to see. But cool. okay. But yeah, that's kind of our quick and dirty rundown of uh rising winds, resurgence booster, reprint booster, reboot booster, whatever you want to call it, RB1 for short. Um yeah. in a nutshell. I'm still not super happy about it and how it ended up. Uh, like I said in the video, I'm just going to be getting singles. I'm not even going to be opening up a box. I might get some Adventure Box 2s just for the alt art um, Mem boosts. memory boosts. Just because those arts are gorgeous. Uh, but yeah. I realistically don't need any of the reprints. And again, not even 10% of the reprints are actually relevant at this current time. Yeah, it's uh it's a little unfortunate, but it's okay. Um it's just a set not meant for us. And that's alright. I mean I'm still gonna buy probably a few. Just yeah. cause I want that stuff. And if I don't get from the few, then I'll just buy the singles. Not a big deal. Yeah. My um, only problem was like I like helping people and when I see people asking what set to buy, the fact that this should this is almost never going to be an option, that's kinda sad when this was supposed to be the option, the pick, but it... I think it's helpful for people that don't have any of these older cards. Yeah, but they're and... all filler. 
That's right. They're filler cards for main stuff. But like if no, but if you, you already have the main stuff, then why do you need the filler? Or if you're going out of like your way to get filler, deck, Raymon, there's there's a few cards that the promo Agumon that does get power craft, but that's still you could use both of those Agumons together. So it's just both of them. I, it's like it's filler. <laughs> it, the thing is, it's still useful. I don't think it's the best, but I don't if see why. If I had why... to tell a new player what set should I get to start the game with? This is not the set because you can make almost no, nothing out of the set. No, you're not telling them to start it. But well, if they're the like, they're oh, I'm missing stuff. If I'm like, oh, there's a lot of cards I'm missing from like older sets, but I don't want to buy those older yeah, sets. You're not going to tell them to go back and buy BT1. That's stupid. No, Just buy this. Would, this is better. I wouldn't <laughs> like, say this that. Is, but if this I had is to infinitely tell better of a set to buy than BT1. Yeah. And it's not even like a choice. It's not even like a, a brainer. You don't even have to think about it. BT, this is infinitely better than buying yeah, any should... of the previous sets. Yeah, excluding but, some of the more important ones that build decks that are still relevant today. Yeah, but the the fact that <laughs> if they're actually looking to play the game, none of these cards are actually relevant because look at Shine Greymon as an example. Yes, you could use the BT2 Shine Greymon, but you just invest in uh, BT12, EX4, and BT13 and the deck is done. You don't even have to think yeah. about it. So you don't need any of these cards to be meta relevant. And that's kind of that's like true. the message that Bandai or like the design philosophy that Bandai has been leaning towards is you don't need these older cards for literally anything. Are they cool and fun and okay to have? Sure. But if somebody is brand new trying to start the game, this is not the product to start with because none of the cards are actually relevant unless you're trying to build towards ghost games in which that is objectively wrong. And uh, because the decks are going to be more expensive to pull towards if you're buying boosters than most of the other decks. Thing is, we're looking at it from the competitive angle and that's not the majority of the player base yeah but we are a from, minute even from a casual group. level like if they're still trying to build something out of the set you can't build anything with this but this is good to just get supportive cards cards that help your other they're not i have a supported deck. cards some of them are not all of them i'm not saying this is the best i'm not arguing to say that this is the best set ever and you need to buy these to help build other decks or yeah, they fill like a lot the... of it. But there are cards that are worth that will be dramatically cheaper in this than going back and just buying the old starter deck stuff or buying them as singles. Then it would be better to just not buy this as a whole, but buy singles from this set. I mean, just yes, because the, they'd be dramatically the the... cheaper than buying the older one. Yeah, at the end of the day, like singles will always be cheaper than sealed products. <clears throat> but like the fact that as a content creator, at least what I like to think of myself as, um, the fact that like I can never recommend this product is just actually sad to me because like it doesn't do anything for anyone. Realistically, it's the reprints are nice. That's never not going to be a thing. But like anyone who's trying to play the game or getting into the game or even trying to expand their collection to have more that they can do with this still just isn't even the set for this, them. This is also a set that helps like high rarity collectors, like people that want like the shiny versions of cards that are like the, there are alt arts for a lot of these cards. So some of these are kind of just purely irrelevant but there's a lot of cards that get like just rarity bumps basically from the SR slots uh, or a lot of the reprint slots and things like that. So it's like that's that's where it's like, OK, but like even then, that's me stretching. That's really reaching to find a reason. Um, but that's where I know a lot of people, at least co on the collector side, were like, yeah, I want upgrades for some of these cards that get them. But that's like a a small group of people and not a lot of people are looking at the set in that lens. Yeah. So like, that's why in my review, I was super <laughs> negative is because the pull rates are bad. The new cards are going to be on the more expensive side than they reasonably should. And I can't really recommend this product to anyone. And like, that's that all led to further frustrations when I was looking at the set from multiple different angles and avenues and that is upsetting but that is the position we as a community put ourselves in uh bandai was going to have it be two separate products they didn't tell us that at the time until it was basically too late and i would have rather had the former rather than the latter 
but moving on to the bigger topic that we were going to be touching on is uh, the fact that we still don't have an online official dedicated Digimon TCG simulator or just digital client. And anyone who's unfamiliar with uh, the story about digital clients, we used to have some of them. They were all unofficial, but they all got DMCA shut down because, you know, they were just essentially breaking the rules, so to speak. I don't know why One Piece's isn't breaking the rules and Digimon's did. I'm not the law person to talk to and uh, I'm not even going to try to begin to break it down. But regardless, we don't have any and it doesn't look like we're going to be getting one for a while. Bandai is working on a digital client for Dragon Ball, but they uh, bait and switched the Dragon Ball players essentially because they tried to make the current iteration of the Dragon Ball TCG work in digital form, but they couldn't get that to work, so they just scrapped it and basically said, here's a simplified version. This is going to be a brand new version of the game. It's still going to be in the Dragon Ball Super family, but it is basically its own separate game. I don't know if that's going to kill what they redefined the current version of the game as Masters. I don't know if it's going to kill Masters or not. Um... Fusion World is the name of the new game, but that is their digital client that they are going to be accommodating it with. So I don't know if they're going to be taking that infrastructure and applying it to their other TCGs or if it is strictly just for Dragon Ball. Uh, I don't know Bandai's infrastructure. I don't know how their teams are developing and designing things, but that is the current basis of the situation is right now, the team is working on getting Dragon Ball up and running. Does that mean that we are going to be getting a Digimon one? I don't think so. There is a lot of business behind games before they're even made. It's funny that like you earlier, you mentioned that like about how like it's like was against rules or there's like specific rules and stuff. How the One Piece one doesn't because like the One Piece one is like has like Eggman's endorsement and things like that. Like, so it's like, how come that one can thrive and function and survive? But then I, I don't know. It's weird. It's really I mean, weird. It, there's, there's a lot of different factors. It could go behind the music, <clears throat> the sound effects, uh, UI elements. Like there's, there's a lot of numerous things that could go wrong and probably have gone wrong for, the old Digimon simulators that we used to have. And Very maybe the One Piece people understand copyright and trademarks a little bit better to be able to dance around that. Not saying that we can't have one developed for us by a fan that actually gets around all of that. Uh, it's just in a, a more dangerous position because Bandai has already said, please do not do this. So, Which that, doesn't make sense because... The other one, like it, it doesn't make sense. Like that, that, that they're the same company, <laughs> so it's like you can't. Uh, they well, said no to one, but one then piece, the other one is Bandai, able to survive. Bandai doesn't own One Piece. The creator of One Piece owns One Piece. Bandai also doesn't exactly own own Digimon, but they have more control over Digimon than they do with like, One Piece. They own the card game, so <laughs> doesn't. And... There, that's what they're using. They're not using. Not only are they using the One Piece IP, but the card game itself. They're using the assets from the card. So how come that I mean, one? Images can... are images. Uh, like that's, that's why none of the uh, manual simulators have gotten taken down is because they're just images. Yeah. Like I can. They're just images put on something. And there's no real way to track that kind of stuff. Right, and it's not like they're stealing any music or anything, or like they're they're literally just images. Yeah, they're not printing, selling them, or anything like that. There's nothing. Nobody's making money off of those things, and if they are, that's a different story. But I mean, granted, one of the Digi Sims was asking for donations, so that that part of could have been part of the problem. Um, so it was the One Piece one. So it's weird. Uh, like I said, it's it, there's it's weird. It's very very weird. But uh, the point is, there's business behind how games are made that a lot of people just don't seem to understand. People just think, hey, wouldn't it just be easy? Wouldn't it just make sense? Wouldn't it just this, just that? Like, they could come up with a million things to try to justify 
the existence and creation of something. But at the end of the day, they don't actually know the business behind it. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, of red tape just to get stuff approved. So just the approval process could take years because they have to come up with UI designs. They have to come up with a lot of base concepts and not even and pitch the idea to make it successful. So like that's that's step number one is just getting it greenlit. That in and of itself can be a year plus process. I don't know. I feel like if they wanted to, they could have done it, but that's not their focus. Oh, clearly it's not, which is fine. I don't really care if there's one or not, to be 100% honest. Well, I know um, a lot of people care, especially when the game is about digital monsters and we're living in a more digital era. It, it does feel like a missed opportunity, but again, they just don't understand game like there's a lot, a of, lot of logistics that goes into that stuff yes so digimon already has a hard time getting its games greenlit as is so having a digital client is already going to be a daunting task to get that greenlit to begin with then on top mm -hmm. of that if they're going to be doing an infrastructure to completely change the foundation of the digimon tcg to include like qr codes or something like that's all infrastructure that they just have to now create that they don't have and that takes up a lot of time a lot of money and various other development resources towards this product to be able to make it work and like people just don't really think and understand and realize that they're just like why couldn't they just do what pokemon does like throwing money at the wall or at a project doesn't innately just make it successful I mean, you color me surprised because I feel like that's the best way to do it. Just throw a metric fuck ton of money into something and then hope it works. Usually well, it does. That's part of the other problem is like now how much money <clears throat> do I have to throw into it? And if I'm throwing too much money at it, even though, yes, it could become a reality if I just have enough money at, uh, put into it. But what is like the budget? What is the the timeline the pipeline the process like there's there's a lot of various things that do just eat up money and if it just is too intensive of a project because they need so much time and money into it it just might not be the returns could very easily just not even be worth it to begin with that's probably the biggest thing my only thing about that is i feel like it doesn't matter because they're such a big company that it, it doesn't matter yeah, but Bandai plays they, things for very, other games. Bandai plays things very safe. Like, absolutely insanely safe. So safe to the point where sometimes it actually hurts them. So, like, look at basically all of their TCG launches. They all suck. I'm not going to lie. They all suck. One yeah, they're piece really bad because awfully. they're just. Like, One Piece launched terribly. Enough. Digimon launched terribly. Battle Spirits launched even worse than both of them. Like, they play things very safe and very by the books so yeah, they it's... don't want to have product just sitting on shelf doing nothing so instead of overprinting the crap out of their product they hold back <laughs> they they don't have this massive wave that they should and they print based on allocation numbers oh you want uh 15 uh like pallets cool we will print 20 pallets so that way you can have your 15 and we have five to do whatever extra percent like they play things very safe and very close uh they are very cold hearted calculated on how they run business to try to maintain as much of their profit margins as they possibly could so them throwing money unlimited amounts of money at a project makes absolutely zero sense unless they know they can make all of that back and right now digimon as an ip has always been kind of volatile in what they can not really get away with, but what they're willing to make for the fans. Well, they don't do enough. <laughs> I mean, That's we know sure. they don't do enough. Like, the IP is a very rich IP. They have tons of lore, and a lot of people care about the IP very dearly. But from a business perspective, it just, uh, like, it's... It's like when Microsoft made fun of Larian for making Baldur's Gate 3 and they scoffed at it and basically called it less than a double A game that they're not even going to look at two seconds of. And look at it now. Baldur's Gate 3 is one of the biggest 
releases of the entire year. And, you know, Larian is laughing it up. They're just like, Microsoft laughed at us. Well, now we get to laugh at them because they were the ones who were stupid. Like, Microsoft played things smart. They, they play things very safe. Yes, it burnt them kind of in the end, but it didn't also burn them at all, which is the other thing. It, it was more of a social burn rather than a monetary burn. Yeah, but those big companies, they don't care about their social things, man. No, they don't, like, which they, is why they, they can do that. Like They can make mistakes and be just fine, as long as it's not something that literally shuts their company down. <laughs> They'll be all right. Right, Those but things. the other the other thing that people don't realize in game development is literally the amount of time that ha that goes into it. So we already talked about how much time it could take, or like we loosely alluded to the fact that they have to go through some red tape, and that in of itself is going to take some time just to get the project greenlit. Now, once it's greenlit, you're going to have time to you need time to develop the thing. It's not just going to poof happen, and yeah, you, you can't necessarily concepts. just copy and paste lots of code and say this is going to work. Because it's not. Yeah, they have to do the whole concept. They have to make sure what so they want UI, it to look there's like. sound effects. There's the actual programming and logic that goes behind everything to tie everything and together. Like, that all animations, takes Animations, because they want to do, like, they're, if they're going to do it, they have to be, like, if we're going based off, like, other card game simulators, they have to, I feel like you have to be at least Master Duel level now, because Master Duel spoiled me in terms of online simulator it's it's I mean, just they don't care about their good. competition they're gonna do what they do and if it sticks <clears throat> well, and they works, do it then... worse i promise you is that, that people just yeah but the they can't they can't say nice. this is our bar like magic arena is absolute dog crap like i hate that client so much <laughs> but it's the only one magic has and master duel isn't really that much better to be honest like these aren't fantastical pieces of technology they're just no, functional. but they put more care into, you can tell. No, they put, they put more care into their monetization and system, and that in of itself is another thing that takes a while to figure out as well. So that's that's another piece of the puzzle that could take a decent amount of time is how do we monetize this? Bandai's going to monetize the hell out of it. You know they're going to be scummy. They're never, they're never good with their monetization. I mean, we can just look at their crappy mobile games where... They just absolutely destroy people, and it, there if they make it, it's gonna have to be mobile because they have to have a mobile version of it because that's just how it is nowadays. Um, it's I don't look forward to. I I honestly don't want an online simulator from them. I'd rather somebody random make one, <laughs> some random person make a good one. Yeah, and but the chances like of a it. random person making a good one versus a dedicated team that's like let's, plugging away at it as their job. I've seen some good ones from other people for other car games. The Yu-Gi-Oh has some good ones. Ha like actually has some good ones that still function right now, even with Master Duel up, that are really nice. One Piece, the One Piece simulator is great. I love playing that one. That one's great. Um what was the uh, i mean vanguard has a good one with deer days deer days is really nice but that's like a full game and you have to pay for that but i like that one a lot that one's not bad um and those are i mean but that one's like owned by them so it's it's a little different but the the two other ones i mentioned like there's some good ones like from people that's just like a, a small group of people or even like one or two people like for example the one piece one i think is only like four three or four people that do it and that's really not that crazy and i'm sure it's not impossible of course things of course have to go right where they don't get just taken down or anything like that but i would much rather someone like that figure it out than bandai because i know bandai is going to scum the hell out of it they're going to make a awful product or it's going to be really nice, but it's going to be monetized so heavily that people are just going to be like, no, this sucks. Why would I do this? And then it's going to shut down, and then they're never going to do it again because they're going to be like, oh, it's so, it was so bad before because no one wanted to buy our stuff. And it's just like, I just, I just don't want them to do it because whenever Bandai makes, they touch things that are like not like physical and things like that, like digital things, it is always awful. It's always like... So I, I am very hesitant for a Bandai 
Digimon TCG Simulator. Very hesitant. Because I am terrified of the, the monetization model they would use. Because I mean, you know they're going to have to do it. They're going to have I, to sell yes. packs. They, they, so they like, are going to have to monetize it. And it is probably going to be a freemium model. And going back to like part of the reason why we don't have a digital simulator, outside of the fact that like some people really, really want one and the various other factors that we've already talked about, like people, it just it just takes way too much time, way too much energy and effort. And it's not this instantaneous magical thing that they could just spit out. Digital card games actually don't do very well in the long run of things like less than uh, massive they have to well, have like even magic is IP. failing right now that they're losing people left and right not only just because their monetization is really bad but like because magic just isn't in a very good state people just would rather not play magic than have what arena is offering and i tried master yeah. duel and i do not like Yu-Gi-Oh as a game at all Master Duel did absolutely nothing to make me even remotely want to play. If anything, Master Duel made me want to play even less because of how bad Yu-Gi-Oh is of a game, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, but I don't think that's the simulator's fault. That's just the game as a whole. But even then, like, I like playing Master Duel. I get a group of people and we'll play uh, older formats, and that's fun. I love it. So it's like, if you're out there just playing... I mean, that is also personal preference. You just don't like Yu-Gi-Oh. There's nothing wrong with that. You're more than that's your opinion. You don't have to like it, but I, I don't think I think Master Duel as a simulator is perfect, like uh, borderline perfect in every way. Even the monetization, it's not bad. It's actually quite generous. Well, you the, can the... earn all stuff for free, and it doesn't take like a million years to earn the stuff for free. No, it's really but... not that bad. But getting. Looking at the other simulators, not just from, like, yes, the big three each has their own, um, but, like, each one took years to develop. I can say, because I was a part of the Arena betas, like, it took Arena five years to get out of beta. Five years to get out of beta. That's insane. And this is Wizards of the Coast, one of the biggest uh, card game companies trying to make their own digital simulator. They had even said, hey, we're going to bring some of our other formats. Have they done that? No. Instead, they just created a completely new format because they couldn't, like, fit it all in. Like, and this is just massive amounts but that of goes cards. With, that goes with the idea of them putting care into it. Where, like... Well, they've also um, had lots of development issues. Like, they've outsourced the development. Uh, the they, developers they, changed they, multiple times. Like... It, it so is more that, of a that falls problem. back on that. That yeah. falls back on the but same what's, thing where they're just putting that, less care into. It. What's what's to say that Bandai doesn't fall into that same type of group where it's just like that, that's okay. why I don't want them to touch it. I'm like, no, just don't. I don't want it. I'd rather just play via webcam. No, but or, like that's not the question people are asking though. People are asking why don't we have it, and instead of listing the reasons on why don't you want it. We have officially lost, like, why people want it, but realistically, Bandai doesn't have the ability to deliver it as of right now. They could deliver it, and it would just be a shoddy product. That's what I know would happen. They could do it. I'm sure they could. Now, are I, they do they, Are they going to actually put the, the, the resources topic. necessary to make it good? No, probably not. But, but the topic is, why don't we? Not, do we want it, and why wouldn't it be good? Like... The, the thing we're trying to discuss is, like, the, the factors about game development that people don't necessarily are fully aware of, which is the reason why we don't have it. Disregarding personal feelings, other simulators aside, and everything else. Like, there are very specific reasons when it comes to game development as a whole on why we don't have it, disregarding the fact that the community keeps asking for one. To be fair, do you really think that people care about I the know reasons they why? They, they don't care that that they have to take no, years I know they, of I... development time to do that kind of stuff. They just want the product, which is stupid to do, because then you get things like Arena Magic. Like, as you say, I have no say in that because I don't know much about it. Um, but then you get things like that where you get 
of, of shoddy product. Well, it's not like don't... the product is shoddy itself. It just got progressively worse because of the maintenance behind it. It was a pretty decent uh, it, attempt to make something really, really good. And then the scope creep got too big to where they just couldn't even do it. Like that that app, just as, as an example, barely has a chat function. Like you cannot chat with anyone but your friends. And it didn't even have a friend function till post beta, like a year post beta. Like it was still very lackluster and very missing in features sure it let you play the game but in terms of what it needed to be a more fleshed out product it very clearly wasn't there and pokemon's yeah. has been pretty bad for years if i remember just because pokemon's literally was like a web based one yeah for a very long time and even then i think they have like a new one it's still not highly well received so like i, even, I don't mind it so it even bad. shows that the big three can't even get their own correct because Master Duel, disregarding the fact that it lets you play Yu-Gi-Oh! is also its own complete separate thing that has almost it zero is. pull on the actual game of Yu-Gi-Oh! itself that people play in paper. It is its own format with its own set of rules that it's doing its own thing. And even if like they were to try to launch their own, like Digimon was trying to launch their own client, uh, they could go the way of the light seekers where it was masterfully tied in physical to digital and you could play both versions of the game just fine. Like it, it was very smart on how it did things. But at the end of the day, it ended up failing just because the retention ne wasn't necessarily there, despite the game being very unique, very interesting and one of the best physical to digital tie ins that I could possibly think of. And even that didn't succeed. So, like, just because you could make a digital client doesn't necessarily mean you always should. And that's part of, like, the business behind the game is not only do you have to think about all of the game development stuff, game design stuff, UI, UX, audio. Like, there's just a lot that goes into making a game itself. But who's to say it's even going to be successful at the end of the day? And it could start off successful and then end up not being successful. And that's all risk management and risk analysis, which as much as I hate like a lot of the decisions that Bandai makes, a lot of their decisions that they make is based on risk assessment and analysis. Mm -hmm. They try is, to minimize I mean, yeah. and reduce it as much as they humanly possibly can. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're also like a archaic older company, so it, it's just kind of how it is. I mean, I mean it's that's not Japan. smart. It's not bad. It's not the worst in terms of being a functioning business it's smart but as the people consuming it it feels like shit <laughs> it feels awful when <laughs> we get like for example the card games coming out dramatically half-baked or not necessarily half-baked but we don't have product available so all the cards are dramatically expensive but we're we're dumb and we're gonna play the games anyway so we still buy the product and Bandai knows it. They'll still they know that people are still gonna buy the stuff, even if uh, they the marked up prices and things like that, because they don't have control of that. That's whatever the market is when it gets out to them, uh, gets out to the people. So it's it is what it is. I I'm not I'm always gonna be on the purveyor, at least when it comes to this. Circling back to the uh, the simulator, I don't think we need it. I don't think it's necessary. Um, the game's just fine without it. I'm not opposed to it existing, but I don't think it needs to exist. Um, at least in the form of how I think they would do it. I don't know how they would do it because they've never done it before. Dragon Ball Super is going to be their first big attempt at it. And I'm not saying that that's going to be the measure of success. Uh, it's going to be a determining factor, but... I like I see value in having one obviously because we're already playing in a lot of online tournaments as is yes I would like more physical tournaments and in-person tournaments as well but that's not going to be the case all the time and it is just easy and convenient which is why people want it and I'm never going to discredit that 
the the idea behind the topic was to bring up why we currently don't have one and one of the biggest topics uh in term like one of the biggest arguments in terms of this topic is the fact that digimon is still too new we are in what our third almost fourth year of digimon as a tcg existing and there's not even like what five uh yeah there's probably not even five thousand cards in the card pool like it's still a very very small game because let's see it is uh no there there would be yeah there's or not there would be more than we would have more than five thousand we probably don't have more than 10,000, which, I mean, card count aside no. is regardless. The fact that that's the game is still number. too new means, like, some people would say, oh, but that's the perfect opportunity because there's not... A, and I would say, yes, you're partially right, but again, there's various factors keeping that at bay. But the fact that they're still feeling out things, like, every company with a TCG is still always feeling things out. We've seen TCGs come and go multiple times, not saying Digimon is going to be one of them, but they don't need to take the risk to try to make a digital client, especially try to rush it or anything. And by the time we do get one, it's going to be years later, even from announcement. So like, I think as a community, we just need to chill with the drive and push for the digital client because i see this all the time on forums at least once a week somebody asks hey when are we gonna get a digital client like it is really annoying and they can easily just look to see that we don't have one there is one currently not announced and we're not reasonably going to be expecting one for a very long time so we don't need to constantly have these discussions every single week and obviously we can push Bandai to do stuff like with the uh, Resurgence Booster, but we can't force them to do stuff like a digital client. No, and I think it's dumb to try and force them. Because I, I just, I, I'm, I think we're all good. I think we can wait a while, wait till they feel comfortable enough to release a well-made client. Because that, at the end of the day, is what I care about more than... I think, that. like, based on their video game department, they can make some very good video games. So, I'm not necessarily questioning the quality of what they can make. It's just, when that's going to happen isn't in our control. It will never be in our control. We could ask it every single day for the rest of our life, and they could still never deliver because they are going to do what they are going to do. If it's too big of a risk, they're not going to take it. If it's not in their development cycle because they already have various other projects, they're just not going to do it. Like, there's multiple different reasons why we wouldn't have one or currently don't have one. And it it's just like how we asked for Rising Winds to change and we ended up with our crappy Resurgence booster. It just is going to be what it is. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a little different, but I understand the logic. Um, I mean, we asked for them to change. They changed it, which was great. I was That was way more than I ever expected and anticipated. But what we ended yeah. up getting is worse than what they would have originally given us. So I would have rather just let the sleeping dog lie, let Bandai cook and do what they need to do because they know what's going on inside of them more than we do so i don't want to push things to be like you said to be bad i don't want them to try to rush development to try to get this out to meet the demand of the masses like i just want them to take their time they'll be ready when they are if we're gonna get one at all and we just all need to chill out and be patient and wait when it comes to the digital like client topic I do think it would be nice to have more than Untap and Tabletop Simulator uh, and technically Octagon, but I think Octagon hasn't gotten an update in a while, uh, no. so people stopped using that. But it would be nice to have more than just those to be able to play the game digitally, but right now, that's just what we have. And yeah. could there be a digital client in the future? Sure. Especially a fan-made one. Uh, they, they're going to have to risk making one, but I think they easily could, 
Uh, somebody's right so. now working on a new manual online one that doesn't look very good and seems like it doesn't run very good, but that's because there's not a whole lot of team and team power and money behind it. It doesn't look awful. It's just, it definitely needs a lot of work. Let me rephrase it, because there's definitely, I mean, first of all, it's manual, like, so that would automatically need to change, but... It, it just needs a lot of more love, which they clearly are doing. And, I mean, there's functions there, like the whole security and all that. Like, it, the UI definitely needs an update, for sure. But it is also just, I think, one or two people doing it. So, um, take that with a grain of salt. So, I, I, I do agree. I think it's just one of those things, we just need to relax about it. Let it, let it be... It'll come if it's going to come. If it doesn't, it is what it is. What can we do about it? Like, we can complain about it, but if they're not going to do it, it doesn't matter if we complain about it. They're, we clearly have complained about it for a while, or people have. I, I have not, but we clearly have. I mean, we're at and, the point where the complaints are more annoying rather than meaningful. Useful. Yeah. Y yes. Uh, and that's kind of, like, the whole reason why I even wanted to bring up this topic to begin with is because... Of the frequency in which I see it. And I do see the game growing as a whole. Which is good. Because otherwise we wouldn't have these posts. every Like literally every week. Um, which is nice. Because you know. That means people are coming in. They're learning that we don't have a digital client. And then now they ask why don't we. And that then the cycle starts to repeat itself. And that's what builds up the frustration. So like. It's cool that the game is still growing. But we also still we just need to chill out when it comes to this topic more specifically because it is a very heated topic because it is something that would change the landscape of the game as we know it, especially depending on how they do tie ins, if they're even going to do tie ins. Yeah, because that's its own unique infrastructure that they currently have zero setup for. So they could be like magic and just throw in some codes or they could be like Pokemon, have it be a little bit more in-depth codes. I don't think we're going to be going like pure light seekers where you just scan the card. That would be cool. No, but no, um, they're not doing that. <laughs> no, know, that would be way too much work. So uh, they also could just do the Yu-Gi-Oh thing where, yep, you are just going to have to buy into your whole collection all over again. Uh, have fun with that. Um, they, they could very easily do that as well. Like, but regardless, it's nice to see that the game grows and continues to grow. But I don't think at this time, having the topic be brought up so often of the digital client is going to be something that progresses the game forward. It'll happen when it happens. There's lots of reasons why it's not happening, which is why we currently don't have it. So it's useless to try to ask for something that they very clearly are not going to deliver on. Yeah, I'm, that's that's where my head is at. Like, it really doesn't matter what we do because clearly, us complaining about it. Uh, I keep saying us, but the community as a whole complaining about it doesn't do it. It's not doing anything. No, they, uh, they at know. least for this specifically. Yeah, they they know what we want because we tell them what we want, and then they try to adjust what their perception of what we want and what they're trying to make is. So. I think that just is the the end of the discussion in terms of like the the whole argument and debate about uh the the need and want and drive to a digital client and why we kind of just don't have one. So I want to thank everyone at this time for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to help support the channel. Uh, please make sure to uh, not only just share on social media, but leave a like, rating, review, follow, subscribe, whatever it is on the various different platforms it is that you can uh, subscribe to, basically, to best support it and follow. Uh, and I want to thank everyone again for listening, and we will see you in the next episode.